was to just um, to to just uh, help get us started. If then no questions, then I guess we uh, <clears throat> proceed. I, I, I don't know if you want me to share the notebooks at some stage for exercises, but perhaps it's not important anyway. Then I should. Okay, sure, no problem. I will share them. Uh, share them. Uh, the the idea really was to again. Um, help us help us get get used to some of the things we will soon start seeing, and I'm, I'm assuming we are going to start seeing them t today. Perhaps I don't know. Uh, which is, uh, but before we start, I was hoping we could. Uh, this is we need to have a conversation about what's what's going on here, and. Uh, it's somewhat related to what was supposed to happen but didn't happen. That's the two assignments. Um, instead of releasing them, I sat there because of the confusion that's going on. I sat and I was like, maybe it would be a good idea to to wait and hear about uh, what sort of plans we'll have for this course um, uh, in the wake of what just happened. I don't know if people are aware, but uh, there's, there's, there's a directive from the Ministry of Health apparently that uh, uh, all the schools and colleges and universities should shut down by Friday. Uh, now, I don't know if this qualifies to, well, maybe, but I don't know, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm guessing we'll be guided by, by the HOD and the postgraduate coordinator, but, but the, the question we should ask ourselves though is like, um, I mean, this has huge implications on some of the planned things, like for instance, was expecting someone from, from UTH next, next Tuesday. I'm assuming we're, going to cancel most of these things. And there's supposed to be someone else here, by the way, who just confirmed participation. Uh, I, I mean, it's obvious for a good reason that we need to you know, cancel these things, I guess, I don't know. But we'll wait and hear from, from Jackson and, and my, but just in case this, we are told, we are directed to say we need to, I don't know why this is not working. Just in case we are directed to, to say we need to, uh, we need to pause for a little while. I, I don't know if um, I have I have a number of ideas here. Uh, we'll wait and hear from from Moses, Dr. Piri, and 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 Mayum about this. But but for starters, I think we just hold on to the the scheduled assessment. So the the mini project that I said was going to be released. I mean, we can agree. I can maybe share the problem sets, and then people can really start looking at them. But certainly the paper reading sessions will have to, to be put on hold. Unless if people agree to some of these word, uh, word suggestions that I have. Uh, last year we briefly, we experimented I think in one or two sessions, we had certain individuals that um, uh, found it really hard towards the end to attend some, some of the sessions that we had. And so we uh, took advantage of um, you know, hangouts and so we'd have these you know, interactive sessions. Uh, so my worry is if we stop this, it would be like we would have to reboot again. So I'm, I'm trying to see if we can, if we are told to stop, maybe we can try and find a way of uh, keeping this conversation going. I mean, I have a few ideas here. Like for instance, um, I can circulate certain papers that are easy to follow. And then if people want those that have the time, we can maybe use this same slot and have some you know, paper discussion sessions. Uh, this won't be a replacement for what we're supposed to do. I guess once we resume, we'll continue from where we left off. But the idea is to make sure that we just keep this conversation going. And then also, um, there are some projects that I've been working towards, like for instance, we just got feedback um, from, um, we just got feedback on this, and uh, this is tied to, <clears throat> um, Uh, 
so what I'm what I was thinking of doing is something else we can do is I can if if people have time for these hangout sessions I can uh, walk you in great depth remember I had one of the examples I had um, when we we're looking at the crisp DM was uh, I think it's related to this so what I can do is I can uh, I can start explaining in great depth what we went through for us to to accomplish this I mean if people are interested I don't know uh, so that by the time we start looking at these learning algorithms at least we'd have a better understanding of of, of what or how we can go about um, taking full advantage of them. So I don't know, I'll leave it up to you to, I guess, decide once we get confirmation from Dr. Peer if you're interested. Um, I know I should have time on Fridays, I don't have anything. I guess people will be quarantined, I don't know about your workplaces, but, but uh, I'll mostly be at, be at home so I can spare some time on Tuesdays for this if you want. If you want, it can be like an offline type conversation where maybe we exchange emails if people have questions. Sorry? Yes, uh, I, would, I would suggest that we maintain the same time because I'm guessing people have already set aside slots for that. So, but something to think about, I guess. I don't know, maybe unless if people have um, plans for this. Okay, and then, uh, so I, I, I saw this strange email, right? Um, We've got this strange email. This is this is tied to what we briefly discussed when I was when we were looking at uh, how to read a paper or something. So there's a call for papers that came from Zikta, right? And I decided to use this as an example because I thought it was very strange. Now this very strange call for papers because uh, it has no details of uh, where this thing, where they publish this, you know. Uh, if it's electronic or if it's print based, and more importantly, they don't state whether or not uh, um, their submissions are peer reviewed, right? And this is tied tied to uh, what I said. You want to pay particular attention to as you're looking for literature online. You want to make sure that you know the sources of information um, are authentic to a certain extent, right? Um, uh, an example, an alternative to this would be um, a platform like CIGAR. Uh, this year I was involved in the peer review process and you notice that there's actually a very rigorous process that goes on, right? So at, at, at a bare minimum you have three people that review uh, each paper or each submission um, and there's a reason why it's three, right? Um, you want to make sure that at least there's an odd number of people. After the review process there, there's um, a discussion that takes place within for, for a period of about a month, right? So that people are able to justify why they rated a paper a certain way. Right. And the, the beauty with such a venue, and I'm sorry that we're shooting ourselves in the foot here, but the beauty with such a venue is that you know that uh, quality is taken seriously. You know, So something to keep an eye out on when you're um, looking for resources to read. You know, Just make sure that the, the, the publication venue itself is, uh, goes through a very rigorous peer review process. All right, so... Um, Today's session, which is data preprocessing and uh, it's type what? Forgotten here. Uh, so, this is wrong actually. It's supposed to be preprocessing and transformation. Um, the outline is as follows. We are going to first of all start by uh, just getting an appreciation of the different types of data that we are going to work with. And then we'll look at um, um, some generic steps that are normally taken when you undergo a process of cleaning up the data. And it's unfortunate that Francis was giving his talk way before we had a discussion about this. Uh, I think what would have been interesting was to find out from him what sort of uh, pre-processing tasks he performed on the image data, right? Um, but I just want to mention that part two is mostly going to focus on text, uh, text or content, right? And then if we have enough time, we'll look at uh, the data transformation. So once you clean up this data, how exactly do you get to format it in a manner that these learning algorithms will be able to understand because it turns out that uh, the initial representation of the information or the data you're working with um, cannot be fed directly into these learning algorithms. So you need to transform it in a format that will be easily recognized by the learning algorithm itself. Okay, so part one. <clears throat> so a reminder here that uh, during our discussion of these uh, five core processes, uh, what we're doing essentially is just uh, still looking at data preparation, right? And, and if you still remember our discussion of data preparation, we mentioned that some of the key steps that you would actually go through involve um, the data selection process where you get to decide what sort of input data you're going to 
to, to take into account. So to latch on, on to Francis' presentation, he made a decision that they were going to go out into the field and get uh, images of the four army wings. And also, they decided to download images from the internet as well. So they, they went through the data selection process that way. <clears throat> And then we also um, discussed the data cleaning or pre-processing process where we mentioned that uh, it's usually the case that this data might be messed up, so you might have outliers in the, in the data itself, so you want to make sure that all those things are isolated. If you have things like uh, uh, duplicates, for instance, you want to make sure that you exclude the duplicates. Um, if you have null values, you want to make the decision as to how you're going to handle the null values. Are you going to exclude records with null values or are you going to replace the null values with some um, derived uh, value, for instance? It could be an average, for instance, um, or some default textual, textual value. Um, and then we also mentioned that uh, the data preparation part also involves uh, the transformation of the data itself, because remember that the, the end goal of here is to come up with a data set that you're going to feed into the learning algorithms, right? So transformation is also part of the data preparation process. And then also, owing to the fact that you would normally um, make use of data sets coming from different sources, um, you go through a process of merging the different data sources. Uh, I guess the closest example here is uh, when I was running us through the um, ICT 11, 11, 10 um, problem sets that we're exploiting at the moment, right? Remember we had information that was coming through from uh, a questionnaire information coming through from the student grades, information coming through from SIS, right, demographic details and things of that nature. Um, and then, so obviously it makes sense that um, at the end of the data preparation process, you merge all those different data sources together. Um, and then obviously the data formatting, you want to make sure that um, if there's need for you to rescale the data, you do that, right? Because it might not always be the case that um, You'd, you'd use the same range of values um, from the original input data set, right? It's fairly common to rescale the values between, uh, val values between zero and one, for instance. There's something similar to a log scale when you're plotting graphs. Um, and then obviously, one of the other things you want to do is to be able to describe uh, comprehensively the data set that you're working with. Right, so in terms of like the outputs, if you remember again, the, the, the outcome for all these different sub-processes here is uh, for your data selection, you want to uh, come up with an inclusion and exclusion criteria, right? It's not always the case that you would incorporate data coming in from all the different data sources, so you want to come up with um, logical reasons for why you want to include a particular data set and ex exclude a particular data set as well. Um, and then the outcome of the data cleaning and preprocessing step, we mentioned that um, is ideally just improved quality of the data that's going to be fed into the model itself. It's one of the reasons why you go through this uh, cleaning and preprocessing step. Uh, the transformation stage would in part uh, result in you coming up with derived fields, right? Um, and of course, transform the values um, for some of the existing attributes. You get an appreciation of this particular step once we, we, we start going through how you, you convert uh, categor categorical values like male or female, right? How do you go about transforming it in a form that a computer is able to understand? It has to be a number, right? You can't use F or M. It has to be a number, right? So you transform it. Um, and then the, the data integration and merging part results in um, just one string or one comprehensive data set that you feed to the model itself. And really what you, you end up doing once you implement the model is using this merged data set, you start playing around with different combinations of the different variables, right, features, as, as we'll learn very soon. Um, and then finally, the formatting will just transform the data into a format that the machine is going to be able to expect. So just a quick rundown of uh, what we discussed when we were looking at this particular phase. Nothing new here, I hope. Um, All right, so but overall, um, again, just to reiterate, the final outcome of this particular process, um, remember it's related to the modeling process or phase, is the actual input uh, data set that's going to be fed into the model, or to the model, um, and then a description of the data set itself. Um, so limitations associated with the data set and the format um, as pertains to the different attributes associated with the data.
All right, so um, again, just to remind us that um, I, I mentioned that you know, when we're working with, when we're working with uh, input data, it comes in various shapes and forms, right? It could be uh, texture data, for instance, um, in this case. And so what we're going to be going through really as we're discussing the data preparation part is to try and understand how we uh, transition from the initial stage, which is the raw input data, um, to the stage where we get to clean it up. Uh, notice here we're cleaning it up and stemming it, removing stop words. Um, and then all the way up to the process where we get to transform it into a form that the uh, learning algorithm is able to understand. Right, so ultimately the goal when you're working with text, for instance, is you want to convert this texture representation into um, a format such as this. And, and really, even though when you're working with text, I guess one of the um, most common ways is to come up with a TF IDF representation of the data, but there are other ways of doing this, uh, like I don't know if you discussed this with uh, Dr. Piri, but uh, things like weight to vec for instance, um, would be equivalent of what we're doing here with the TF IDF um, representation of the data. Right. And what this does, uh, again, we have a discussion about this, but what this does really is, is it looks at, um, um, because remember the data set you're working with, if you're working with documents, will be composed of uh, uh, abstracts associated with the different observations of the data sets, right? So the goal is to come up with uh, one vector representation that contains all, well, at least in theory, all the strings, all the strings, the unique strings that are found in the different documents that make up your data set or your corpus, right? So if your vocabulary has, let's say, uh, a unique set of words that totals 500, then this vector will have 500 columns, right? Um, and so this is showing you to say uh, the word uh, Zambia studies or something, not Zambia studies, but Zambia use, the combination of the word Zambia use is found one time in this particular abstract or a combination of abstract and title. Uh, and something else I wanted to mention whilst still on this um, slide here is the fact that uh, it really doesn't matter that, uh, so this is a result of stemming, it doesn't matter that you have thesis instead of thesis, right? Because the computer doesn't care. Human being might care, but the computer doesn't, doesn't care that this is shortened to thesis and Zambia is, uh, uh, or studies is shortened to study, for instance, right? Just stemming it so that you, you isolate um, words that are derived from the same root word. Okay, uh, again, just to kind of um, uh, highlight the fact that you typically be working with different types of data sets, right? Um, and really one, what you soon realize is that um, these different uh, data sources that you'd be working with are associated with different types of attributes, right? Um, <clears throat> All right, so fundamentally when you're working with, uh, with, with, with these uh, observations or instances of the data, one thing you realize is that um, these different instances will be associated with different attributes, right? So, um, and by attributes we are, we are really referring to the characteristics associated with the different values associated with the data. So if we were to go to this particular example, um, the value associated with the quizzes would be a separate attribute the student ID would be a separate attribute. Um, you could view, I guess, a textual representation of, of this particular abstract as being um, an attribute in its own right. But, and I know this is revision uh, from our, our stats discussion, hopefully somewhere at fourth year or third year or something, depending on how long your program was. Um, what we do know that, irrespective of the type of data you're working with, fundamentally, um, the attributes associated with this data can be categorized into two main parts, right? So it's either the uh, attributes is categorical in nature or it's continuous, right? Um, and really when you're referring to categorical attributes, um, there are three main forms, the examples, don't worry. Um, so there are what you call nominal attributes. So these would be um, uh, discrete values that represent two or more categories. Rich, poor, uh, rich, poor, and I guess comfortable something, I don't know, making things up, so two or more, right? Uh, good, bad, neutral, something, right? 
Um, and then um, you also have ordinal attributes. Um, th these are more or less like similar to nominal attributes with the one key difference, the fact that with ordinal attributes, the order is somewhat important, right? So uh, if you look at male and female, it doesn't matter if you start with male or female, right? The order doesn't matter. But if you're looking at uh, things like uh, grades, or if you're looking at Likert scale like data, then you know that um, the order uh, matters because uh, strongly agree is obviously better than strongly disagree. Right. And then you also have um, dichotomous data which is just uh, similar to uh, nominal attributes uh, with one key difference. You'd be dealing with just two values here. So gender, for instance, male or female. Right. Assuming there's no neutral here. Um, and then you, um, you also have continuous attributes, um, which, which um, if, you, if you are to compare continuous attributes to categorical attributes, you, you are more or less uh, referring to qualitative data here, or descriptive information when you're dealing with categorical values, right? But when you're talking about or making reference to continuous attributes, what you're dealing with uh, qualitative data, quantitative data, rather. so numbers for the most part. Um, and really when it comes to the types that you'd be dealing with, uh, it's either inter interval attributes uh, or racial attributes. Um, and the difference between the two really is such that uh, when you're dealing with uh, interval attributes, what you're looking at is just a continuous range of values. Um, racial attributes are more or less similar to interval attributes with one key difference. Uh, a zero has no significance for racial attributes, I don't know if this makes sense. So I guess if you look up literature online, they'll cite examples like uh, if you're looking at somebody's weight, you, you, if you say zero kg, it has no meaning, right? But one kg has a meaning. Okay, so again, just to kind of uh, give us some, um, some, some random examples of these different types of attributes. Uh, so if you look at interval attributes, I guess, uh, using our example from the CRISP-DM uh, walkthrough we had here, we'll be looking at grades here, the range of values that fall within a D, a C, a C plus, right? Um, and some other key traits are that you can, you can literally perform some sort of mathematical operations on the range of values. And really when I'm, I'm referring to the Ds and C pluses, I'm actually referring to the actual ranges, not the, the text representations of the Ds, right? If we look at the Ds themselves, as they appear here, would be referring to uh, ordinal attributes. I don't know if this makes sense. But, but if you are referring to the ranges that fall within the Ds and the C pluses, then we're saying the interval attributes or something. Okay, um, and then in terms of the racial attributes here, I'm, I'm loosely using this C example here. Uh, I know that in, in certain circles, maybe a negative score is there, it exists, right, if it's a penalty or something, but I'm assuming that uh, we, are, we are looking at a case where you're saying zero means nothing at all, right, so it has to be greater than zero or something. So it's an example of the racial attribute from our data set. Let me just say, when I look at the the yes. Like, uh, hashed values? Yeah, this, so these, these are just hashed values. It's trying to mask, uh, oh. deliberately trying to mask people's identities here because this is uh, actually, it's not uh, manufactured data, it's actual data. It's, uh, I don't know if they'd be happy, but to see their names being <laughs> flushed around. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know. <clears throat> and I know what you're thinking, you can easily reverse engineer or something. But no, these are hashed from, guess what, these are, these are hashed from here. <laughs> so, so you can't actually reverse it. It's not the hash of the student ID, so don't waste your time. It's the hash of these, um, you know, doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, all right, so an example of, uh, and I know again, uh, these days this is becoming a, a hot issue, I guess, in Zambia, I don't know. Some people would say I, uh, I'm non-binary or whatever, but we're assuming, we're looking at a case where it's just male or female here, right? So, so sorry? 
Yeah, but, but, but we're looking at, uh, in our case, this data set only has two values. So it's an example of a dichotomous attribute, right? Um, so listen, I mean, it's a, uh, I'm walking us through this to just, uh, it's like revision, but it turns out that the way that you transform these different um, values is different. So the way that you transform a categorical value into a representation that your learning algorithm will be able to understand is different from the way that you transform an ordinal value. It gets even more interesting when you're working with things like dates, even though you might think that a date is uh, continuous, right? Technically speaking, but it turns out that the way that you transform those things is different as well, right? So it's just something to keep at the back of our minds, right? Uh, the fact that depending on the type of attribute that you're working with, the transformation process will be different. Uh, so I know the revision for the people in the room here, one hot encoding and all those funny things. Okay, so uh, examples of nominal attributes would be um, the minors section here, the mi minors column. Uh, our st these particular students have a major and a minor, right? So we have, uh, I think an in any given year, we have an average of about five to six uh, minors. That's more than two categories, right? Which is why we're saying it's nominal. Um, but another key trait is that the order doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you say, I'm going to start with civic education or languages, uh, unless if you want to bring in the argument of the alphabet or something, which still really pointless, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, and, and again, if you were to compare it with some of these other attributes, notice that the only mathematical operation that you'd be performing on something like this is an equality test. You, maybe you'd be interested in testing if uh, a civic education value is equal to languages or something, I don't know, right? Nothing else, you can't add these things, right? Um, you multiply them or something. I don't know if this is making sense. Um, and then an example of uh, ordinal values, again, still from our data set. Um, we normally ask, um, um, we normally have like, uh, questions that involve uh, uh, the students uh, filling out some um, some Leckett scale, right? Uh, so this is an example here. Uh, us trying to find out the sort of experience people have using computers, right? Um, we know that there's some significance when we find a person who has five years experience when compared to someone who has one year experience using computers. So the order matters, right? ordinal attribute. Uh, I always run out of examples besides, besides uh, things you find in a questionnaire. I don't know if people have ideas on where else you can find ordinal values here. Examples of ordinal values other than things you find in a questionnaire. You, I don't know if... Uh, would you say uh, income, if you look at, uh, well, I guess, I was going to say the Zambia Demographic House and survey, but incomes, right? Uh, would you say those are ordinal values? So different levels of income values, right? If you come up with income brackets. But, but perhaps also something else you, you can, we could cite is uh, uh, people's ages. Usually, and again, this is in questionnaires. Usually they'll ask you, what, how old are you? They will, not, they will not ask you to state the actual age. It's, it's a range. You choose, say, I'm between 25 and 30 or something, right? 30 to 35, 30 to 40, right? Um, so again, these are ordinal attributes. The way that you uh, convert them into a, a representation that the machine is able to understand is different from, from this and this, right? So something to remember here as well. Hey, I, I, uh, I have a question here. What, what sort of uh, attributes would we be working with if we are looking at text data? Remember, the, the, when we are referring to attributes of data, we're just saying characteristics of that information that helps help us describe the information or the, the observations associated with that data set, right? So what, uh, what type of attribute would be associated to this type of data? Would this be ordinal or something or or would this be categorical, say, say not categorical, right? But uh, I don't know. Um, 
I, I, one way of thinking about this is uh, asking yourself simple questions like does the order matter or something? Um, and also, I guess, uh, think of this from the point of view of um, the eventual representation of this information to the perspective of the learning algorithm, right? So, um, even though the default things you'd be working with will order these things in alphabetical order, but it, it wouldn't really matter if, if this column was the first one, right? Two or more, uh, it, we could easily view these as categories, no? It's certainly not continuous data here, right? So we could view these as categories, two or more categories, right? Um, two categories, two or more categories, where order is not important, right? Something to think about here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, another question here, I mean, when we are, oh, we're already given it. Well, I was going to ask, say, what about uh, image data, like what Francis was, was discussing. I know we haven't really got into a stage where we're working with data, but I, I think there was a sneak preview last week where I showed us exactly how these learning algorithms get to, or what sort of um, input they expect from images, right? You unroll this into the respective pixels, right? So this would be like a distinct attributes as well. No, I already mentioned text here. Uh, we'll soon see exactly how we, we get to take advantage of models such as the bag of words we need to come up with a uh, presentation that we want to feed to the model itself. I, I don't know if uh, that was a good enough intro to uh, data attributes, unless if people want uh, another exercise of examples of data attributes. Maybe you have questions of uh, certain types of data, perhaps at the bank or something that you work with that you, you, you can't really um, classify as being, or you're a bit confused as to which type of category it falls under, no? No, okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I thought then we'd uh, merely transition and just, uh, just have a, a short chat about uh, the data preprocessing tasks and then at some stage, uh, I just want us to just work through a few, a few things in a Jupyter notebook that I have shared, just so we can um, get an appreciation of exactly how we go about performing some of these uh, generic uh, preprocessing tasks. And you notice that irrespective of the type of data that you're working with, there are certain things that you, you, you just have to do, like de de duplicate, uh, I mean, deduplication, for instance, uh, uh, getting rid of or handling null values, for instance, and then there are certain things that are only specific to certain types of data, uh, like remove of stop words. You can't remove stop words from categorical data, right? You can only remove stop words from um, um, uh, text, for instance. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, so, again, um, uh, a reminder here that uh, we are essentially just, again, still looking at data preparation here. Uh, and when you're cleaning up the data, some of the generic things that you end up doing is, um, like I've mentioned before, trying to get rid of the duplicates. Um, handling null values, and then uh, dealing with outliers. So if you come across, if, you have, uh, if you're working with student results and you have one person who got 90% and everybody else is hovering around the 50s and 40s, it will probably be a good, a good idea for you to make a decision um, with regards to how you're going to handle that one observation, right? Perhaps just exclude it from the entire data set or something. Uh, or perhaps collect more data so that you have more of observations that fall within that particular range. Uh, what I've done in the past is I just, I, I get rid of outliers and it's, it's happened quite a lot. So. Uh, working with um, descriptive metadata from ETDs, for instance, when we come across um, a school where we have very few ETDs, like ID, for instance, what what we've done in uh, past analysis is we've just decided to exclude uh, ID because when performing an inter-faculty analysis, it really wouldn't make sense to look at IDE as, um, as an independent entity because you only have a few observations there. <clears throat> but depending on the analysis, perhaps you just merge it with uh, the score of education itself because it turns out that the 
the subject area that is handled in the two faculties is more or less the same. And the same goes for schools like VET, for instance, and medicine, right? Um, so again, when, when it comes to specific types of um, uh, data like uh, textual content here, um, uh, it turns out that it's, it's the one type of data where you, you get to do a lot of things, right? So stemming, uh, stop with uh, removal, you might uh, want to make sure that you, you, you use um, or you transform text using a consistent casing, for instance, so make a decision as to whether you're going to use all lowercase or all uppercase letters, right? Um, and again, so the, the generic step that you go through here is you remove the duplicates, you remove the null values, you deal with the outliers, and then finally you perform the uh, preprocessing steps associated with uh, textual content. So uh, stop word removal, um, um, case folding, uh, stemming of the words themselves. Okay, uh, I don't know if there's an explanation here. Okay, there is an explanation. So a com comprehensive list of uh, things that you, you tend to, to do insofar as text is concerned here is uh, uh, make sure that your, 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 your text is represented using a consistent casing. Usually I've gotten away with all lower case. If you want, you can go with all upper case, but certainly not uh, camel casing. And then you, you go through a process of uh, stemming the words. So you want to make sure that uh, the examples here, but you want to make sure that things like women, woman, um, uh, actually stem to one thing because they're the same thing, right? Uh, remove stop words. By default, when you're working with text, you typically have access to stop words associated with the different languages like English, French, um, Portuguese, for instance. Uh, but, but if you find yourself in a situation where you're working in a particular domain that has additional stop words, you want to make sure that you take those things into account. So for instance, if you are working with text uh, associated with ETDs at UNSA, we know that Zambia is bound to be a stop word. University of Zambia is bound to be a stop word. It doesn't make sense that you include it in your, um, in your uh, uh, final vector that's going to contain those unique, unique phrases. Why? Because it's a common, common occurrence. It's something that you are bound to find in all of the different ETDs, right? maybe on the cover page, the University of Zambia or something. Um, you want to make sure that you remove all the different punctuations. This can be tricky depending on the domain you're working in. So things like commas, uh, question marks, exclamation marks. Um, again, there are packages, we'll soon see in examples, there are packages that you can use that have default punctuations that already exist. But you want to be careful when you're working with, let's say, text that contains mathematical formulas, for instance, right? Uh, and, and, and if those, those particular uh, things that you incorporate into the formula are important to you. Deduplication, missing values, and then tokenization. Although the tokenization part is really associated with uh, transformation of the text itself. <clears throat> okay, I mean, so just examples here. Uh, uh, what you're doing is uh, making sure that uh, words like these uh, are considered to be the same. If, if you remember, now, I would like to think this is the same in respect to the programming language you're referring to, but if you remember our discussion of Python, we said that Python is case sensitive, right? So you want to make sure that uh, uh, you normalize um, the text to a, a common or consistent casing. Uh, there is, I think, uh, hmm, there should be a built-in, a Python built-in called, uh, let me see. There should be a, a Python built in code uh, lower, right? Just a little example here. Uh, just to showcase how trivial this is when you're working with text. So in Python, there's a built in function. Uh, Uh, so what you'd be doing is, uh, oh, is this? oh, because this is an object, I guess, it would be x dot lower, right? Right, so you want to make sure that uh, all these different representations, and this, you notice from the Jupyter Notebook that this, these are the things that you'd be doing, really, to make sure that um, this thing here is made to look the same as, um, uh, as its uh, lowercase representation, right? If you want, uh, I guess it should be upper. 
Now, I, uh, I don't know if there are people that have bothered to, I always, I just remember, yeah, I always uh, say lower or, or upper here, but I wonder if people have thought about maybe title casing proper, right? Do you think that would be consistent? If you decided to say, instead of lower or upper, I'm going to, to go with title casing. So all the ways are going to have to be proper, right? So the University of Zambia, the text representation, all the texts will have the first letters uppercase. So I think you can do this proper. No? Ooh. I guess I'm, 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 swapping, I'm swapping things around here. I think proper should be, proper should be here. Do I apologize here? Uh, okay, I was referring to Excel, sorry. Uh, but there should be a way of uh, converting, I don't know if anyone knows the, a way of converting a, a text from whatever casing into uh, a format where the first, the initial, the initial character of every word is going to be an uppercase letter, everything else is lowercase. Uh, but think about this for a second, it would still be consistent, right? Because each word will have um, the first characters being um, uppercase and then everything else is lowercase. I don't know if that's, um, that makes sense to people here. Anyone know of a Python function for I'm obsessive here, why dot? Oh, shoot. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, you found it. Thanks. Oh, title. Thank you. There we go. Thanks. Uh, and again, because you're running on an object, uh, Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so you'd, uh, you'd convert it into something like this, right? In case you're thinking, but what about numbers? It really doesn't matter whether you have numbers in your text or not. Uh, if you apply lower, it's just going to be the same, right? Um, I don't know if that makes sense here. Uh, um, right, so stemming essentially just involves you uh, Converting all the different derived words into their root form, right? So I gave an example of woman, men, man is the same, uh, females, female is the same, Zambia, Zambians, uh, I don't know what else is there, Zambia, Zambians, Zambian, right? That's that's the same thing. You are referring to the same. You'd be you'd be really trying to describe a, a similar concept. Right, so it makes sense that you just reduce it to its common stem. Um, um, and, and, and really the idea is to make sure that you reduce on, because remember when you're working with text, right, the, the resulting um, matrix that you're going to be working with or the vector is going to be really large, so I want to make sure that it's as small as possible. Uh, and it turns out really that um, there, there are a number of ways of uh, stemming, um, but Porter stemmer happens to be one of the most uh, widely used uh, uh, stemming algorithms out there, and it's quite easy in Python. We'll look at examples just now. Um, it is uh, the same stemming algorithm that is, or that was used to represent things we are seeing here. Uh, like this, absent, right? Uh, acad, well, is, I guess, it's academ, you know. Um, Zambia star D or something, right? Uh, in case you're wondering why Zambia is not stemmed here, it's, it's because, and we'll get to this at some stage, it's because, um, so I think in this case we were, we were coming up with a representation that would have um, uh, trigrams, right? So a combination, at the maximum combination of at least three ways that follow each other, right? So what you end up doing is you just stem the last part. Okay. Uh, all 
I'm assuming this is a uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, revision for most of us, right? I don't know if we've done this already somewhere. Pre processing of text. No, anyone? Yes, no, no. Okay. You might, you, you, I would appreciate it if you told me the parts that you think you'd need more examples and because uh, it's difficult to make assumptions in certain instances, right? Uh, <clears throat> okay, oh, so more examples here. Um, so canonical versions, countries versus countries, it's the same thing. Uh, now what would be interesting here is to, if you, were, if you happen to be working on, um, I guess a problem that would involve working with Zambian local languages, figuring out, because you can't use port as stemmer to stem words in the local language, right? It would actually give you the wrong results. It would still stem them, but they wouldn't really be correct things. What would be interesting is if you could come up with uh, a way of doing that for local languages. And it doesn't have to be all the local languages, but maybe Bembo or something, right? Uh, it turns out it's not easy for certain languages. I know of people um, <coughs> working in the lab I used to work in that are uh, working on a number of such natural language processing problems, right, with Isizulu and Isitosa and all those different languages. Uh, yeah, so such so food for thought if you are looking for maybe inspiration. Uh, we have a lot of people um, in the School of Education and I think Humanities that um, work in this area, languages, not this, but uh, languages, right? So they, they've already studied the different languages. So it's not like you'd have to go out there and redo things. You just have to sit down with them to try and understand exactly how the Chichewa vocabulary is or how the Silozo vocabulary is, right? I mean, that be it. Um, right, and then, so the other thing here is, uh, again, stop words. Uh, typically, there are packages, um, like I said, that you can take advantage of that who have predefined um, stop words for the different popular languages. Afrikaans, and, uh, English, are not popular, but languages that are represented online or languages that have a lot of support online. So these might be small uh, languages like Afrikaans, but the people actively working to ensure that um, uh, content in Afrikaans online is properly presented, right? I hope we can do that for Chicheo and Bemba or something. So all you're doing is just removing those common words, the stop words, um, and, and the idea is to try and avoid uh, them impacting the overall re relevance of, of the text, text uh, content that you'd be working with. But like I said, um, in certain instances, depending on the domain, it might just become necessary that you might want to add additional stop words to um, the default language stop words that you'd be working with. So to your default English stop words, uh, if you're working within uh, the life sciences, maybe you remove uh, common words specific to that particular domain. If you'd be working with uh, laws, for instance, you include those uh, common stop words in laws. I don't know what they are here, right? Um, Again, it's very easy, so you use, uh, I know NLTK has, um, has a way of, um, of um, accessing English stop words, which is, for the most part, for most of the examples, we'll, we'll be using the English stop words, so it, you see how trivial it is to actually do this, right? Um, and then, again, when it comes to removing punctuations, all you have to do is just um, uh, reuse, um, th there's already existing packages that allow you to do this in Python, but, but um, also what you can do is you can just take advantage of um, Python to isolate them individually yourself. So you know the, stop, the punctuations, right? Commas, semicolons, exclamation marks, ampersand sign, all those funny things, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then um, you want to make sure that you're able to detect um, duplicate entries. Now, the, the duplicate entry is a, a bit interesting here because there's, there's different ways of looking at duplicate entries, right? So it, it could be the case that uh, duplicates occur in a column within your data set, or a duplicate could be associated with a complete row, right? So those are things to think about. Uh, and you'd have to figure out exactly how to isolate those different things here. Uh, Like if you had a, 
so a row of student records and um, you have an identifier for instance uh, I'm trying to think of a better way of trying to explain instances where you would um, instances where you would have uh, uh, duplicates in a row and duplicates in a, in a column right so okay so you have you have a record that has a student uh, okay student ID NRC uh, and perhaps uh, okay let's just say major right now in an ideal case if you're looking at detecting duplicates by row maybe if you have uh, instances where you have this x uh, y x z uh, v, 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 you know that uh, these are this is a duplicate row right but what if uh, for some for some reason the the data that you are working with tells you to say this particular person has an NRC of of let's say p but the student id is the same right if if you are looking at detecting duplicates by row then uh, obviously you, you wouldn't be able to to figure out that these particular rows are the same right but if you are trying to detect duplicates based by column, then you'd be able to pick out to say, in actual fact, this entry is the same as this. And maybe there was just a data entry. That's the reason why maybe you have different values for the NRC. And, and again, really, um, uh, you see from the examples in here that uh, detection of duplicates is pretty trivial with pandas, right? It's just as easy as uh, running the dot duplicate function right um, and then that's it and I know right people are thinking but uh, what if I wanted to do it before right you can I guess it's fine so you can detect duplicates if you if you feel much better detecting duplicates in Excel and then moving them to pandas or to your linear algorithm you can do that as well it doesn't matter what tool you're using but if you are looking at incorporating you know Python pandas into your into your um, workflow your pipeline just uh, remember that there's easier ways of doing this and the examples in the Jupyter notebook just now. <clears throat> all right, uh, again, um, so you'll notice really that, uh, all right, see, fine. You'll notice really that for, for, for some of these uh, steps or processes that we're looking at, um, a decision would have to be made on what exactly you'd want to do, right? You wouldn't just uh, you wouldn't just uh, decide to say uh, for this particular data set what I want to do is I just want to detect duplicates by row, right? Um, you have to sit down, I guess, after analyzing the data, to decide if there are certain fields that might necessitate that you you detect du duplicates by column as well. So the same goes for missing values. You'd have to decide on whether you are going to discard uh, entries with missing values or if you are going to uh, come up with default values that you are going to insert into the um, columns with null values. Uh, and in most instances, those decisions are actually dictated by the amount of data that you have. So if you are someone like Francis who has only 700 or so uh, observations, um, you don't have the luxury of excluding data, you want to make sure that you find ways of uh, fixing the problems associated with missing values, for instance. Um, <clears throat> uh, so for, I don't know if we have an example, but for numeric values, it's very common for you to just come up with an average. So if you, if you have, um, again, it depends on the problem. If you have, if you're looking at in income levels of people and it so happens that one of your observation has no value for the income, what you could do is decide to say you're just going to get the average of all uh, the records that have values and then pad or insert the null value with the average. Um, for grades, what I do myself is I just replace it with a zero. Well, at least for the example with the student grades. Okay, so this is what I was saying here. So dropping the fields or replacing them uh, or using a derived field essentially. But you'll have to make the decision yourself. All right, so I, I thought maybe now would be a good time for us to just look at some, uh, a, a simple Jupyter Notebook walkthrough. Walk um, 
maybe we can also uh, try and play around with this and try and see if we can make sense out of this thing. Um, so as usual, I will share this on the on the um, <clears throat> on the collaborative editor. So if you can, you should be able to find these things here. Uh, <clears throat> very basic uh, examples that we have and and um, what I was hoping we could do is uh, instead of doing the exercises ourselves but uh, I'll, I'll be walking you through exactly what's happening and then you can run you can run through the examples yourselves and, and try and see if you can pl play around with the, with the notebook itself. So if you go here, I think you should, should have bookmarked it. You will, find, um, you will find these things here. Okay, so this is the link right here. All you have to do is just go here. Uh, oh, uh, this should I forgot to? So should that one have a one at the end, or should it end with four? Oh, so four one. Sorry, it should be a one at the end. I don't know why I did this. I'll put it at the, the one with the one at the end. That's fine. That will be the last entry down there. And uh, for those of you asking for the pa password is password for one plus three T. If you need access to Wi-Fi, access sorry. One plus three T. Uh, maybe the classroom could f follow up with these guys to find out the password for postgrad. I don't think it's supposed to have the password. But <clears throat> uh, so you the the only strange things that you will notice here is uh, how to use Porter's stemma, for instance. Look at it just now, and then some um, examples on how to use pandas to detect duplicates and walk us through. Everything else should be the same. Like I mean. Uh, uh, case folding is pretty intuitive because what you're doing is you're making use of. Um, uh, the built-in functions, right? Uh, uh, let's see what else uh, you're going to. So stemming. Uh, so the stop weights removal is um, is going to require that you use NLTK. Um, that's yet another Python library here, uh, natural language toolkit. Um, but you look at the, you soon see the examples, see exactly how you get to do that. Can I move to the notebook and then? So all you have to do is just import the once you download the notebook, import it into import it into uh, import it into Google Colab, and then boom, that's it. You should be able to, or if you've installed, uh, if you've installed Jupyter Classic, then you should be able to do that also. But you just want to make sure that you, in Google Colab, you, you have, um, you download also those two CSV files because they're the ones that are, uh, that are used in the notebook itself.
Okay, again, in case people are, are wondering here, yeah, as you're walking through the notebook, I don't know if everybody has this, but uh, uh, please ignore the, <laughs> the first two cells. So the first two cells, I use them to, because I understand that some people might maybe struggle to run this. So what I do also is I, if you've noticed, I always share the PDF and the uh, um, IPY NB uh, file, right? So the idea is to, for you to have access to this, which has already, the PDF document will always have uh, the stuff already generated. So the, the code that you're seeing in the first two cells generates this part here and, and the table of contents. So you can ignore it, that's not important. In fact, you can exclude it from, once you download this notebook and, and you, you, you import it into your Colab account, you can exclude it. These two things are not important here. These two cells here, these are irrelevant, really. Okay, so if you need, uh, I don't know if everybody has done this, it'd be nice if we could uh, play along here. Uh, yes? No? Uh, uh, is everybody okay with the downloading of the notebook? Oh, the link, sorry. And, uh, there we go. <coughs> Are you okay with the notebook there? Or? No? Yes. Uh, you have to mount the drive. Oh, you want to mount the drive. Yeah, you can. so you can do two things. So. Maybe the mounting of the drive will take time. So if you're, if you're using Colab and you're planning to mount and you think it's going to take time, you can just upload those things. But, but remember the difference between uploading and mounting is that uh, once the session dies, then everything will be wiped. So then every time you want to do this, you'd have to. So you can either just click the um, file. Did you, have you downloaded the IPython from here? Have you gone, you want to? We can go here first, yeah, there, or you, or you download, yeah, so and then just uh, say open notebook or something, or upload notebook, Up, upload notebook, and then, yeah. Is there anyone else uh, struggling with something? Yeah. This. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, 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 that folder has, uh, has everything we, we will need to do this. Um, I'm tempted that maybe, I don't know, maybe next week when we meet, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. I was thinking of which data set we can use for images as you're working through this. And uh, I don't know, maybe the Lord digits or something. Or maybe, I was thinking maybe we can ask Francis to share his data set perhaps. I don't know if people would be interested. That would be fun. Instead of using the generic, um, I don't know, the the low digits data set or something, I don't know. Um, can I start the walkthrough? Is it fine just to explain what's happening as you're running this? You want to make sure this is running for you as well, right? Um, I mean, so you notice that uh, this particular cell, what I'm doing is pretty t trivial stuff here. Uh, so listen, uh, line number, and so far as text processing is concerned, of course, line number two, three, and four are important, right? First line is nothing more than a comment. Um, line number two will enable me use pandas, right? I'm importing pandas as PD. So somewhere down here, you should be able to see PD dot, PD dot, then I'm using Python pandas. Um, and the line number three allows me to import a regular expression, RE, right? And I think this is where uh, this package allows us to gain access to punctuations. I think my memory says me right, but we'll, so, we'll soon see just now. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember. Is it? The link? Oh, okay. Uh, and then, this should have been rewritten somehow here. Uh, line number six will only become relevant once we start looking at the transformation of the data, right? Um, line number seven is not really important because all we are doing is, uh, uh, you know, it's to do with the, the Jupyter notebook itself, so ignore line number seven. Line number eight allows us to 
gain access to stop weights. So what you want to do, maybe just a quick test here is um, if you were to open a new cell and before we start running the thing, I think it would be important for us to look at some of these examples here. If you open a new cell below and you just run this command from nltk.copas import uh, stop words and then right below that uh, create another cell. If I just say uh, stop words dot, what is it? How do I access the stop words? Well, if all else fails, help. I'm trying to see how we can gain access to the English stop words here. Uh, I guess it would be DRR, DIR. Dot words. I couldn't see words here. That's weird. I wonder why I can't see words here. But anyway, so uh, apparently, if I want to gain access to, according to this, this should work or something. Right, so this is what I was talking about. So what, what you'd be doing when you're working with English text is, uh, you are removing these things here, right? Uh, because they, it, so when you're working with text data, uh, any occurrence of he, uh, they, them is irrelevant. It adds, it doesn't add any value to, when you look at the, when you, when you look at the individual words, right? Not the meaning, not the semantics of the, the combination of so many multiple words, but the individual words, he, she, him, uh, has this make no sense, right? So these are the things you're looking at. And in fact, if you're interested in finding out how many stop words there are in English, I guess we can use the built-in len, right? So what we're doing is removing these 179 words. Um, and I do believe if you happen to find yourself working with French, I guess, I don't know, French, then these are the stop words you'd be removing. So what I was saying about Chichewa and DC laws is uh, we'd have to perhaps go to a linguist and ask them what, what, what sort of stop words uh, are a part of the uh, in vocabulary, right? And then they'll be able to give us this. And so if you were analyzing data from Facebook, uh, those funny comments that people make in a combination of different languages, you'd isolate the different languages and then narrow down to silos and then you remove the uh, stop with associated with slows, right? Uh, anyway, I don't know if this is making sense. Is that fine? Um, yes. <coughs> NLTK? Yes. yes, it it tells you if you don't have it on your machine because so some of these the actual stop words actually are text files. Once you download, there'll be text files sitting on your machine. So the usual instructions it tells you how to download, right? Yeah. So you just follow the instructions. But, but you only get to download it once, not multiple times. And I think if you're using Google Colab, you sh I don't know if it also prompts you to download, I don't know. It does, right? Yeah. Okay, so again, uh, so, hmm, so the portal stem, right? Um, you, you actually gain access to it using NOTK as well, right? So this, is, this would be our line number nine here. Uh, so you just import from nltk.stem.porter, you import the porter stemmer. Um, and then you, you just create at some place down here, you notice us create um, an instance of the porter stemmer, right? Porter stemmer, let's just go down to it. Yeah, uh, so you create an, an instance of the porter stemmer and then using the instance of the portal stemmer, you can then stem individual words. So if you look at, uh, so if we were to say, um, 
again, if we just go back here, before we start running the examples, I thought we'd just look at some, some individual things specific to what we're discussing there. So again, if I go in the cell and then I, I, um, I import porta stemma and then I'll just say var porta is equal to uh, zip. Um, and then using this, I would then be able to stem individual words, right? So uh, am I doing the right thing here, the porta dot stem, right? So observe, if I say man and porta dot stem, if I say main, right, what am I doing here? If I run these things, This is a bad example. Ah, study. Okay, let's, let's just do one. So, study is study, right? Studying, studying is going to be stemmed to the same root phrase. That's the whole point of stemming, right? Studying is the same as study. It's the same as uh, studied, right? So this is this is the whole point of doing studied. Um, all of these are stemmed to the same thing. Now, I don't know if um, we can stem uh, Zambia, Zambia, Zam sorry? Zambezi. No, I don't, I don't think so. Zambe Zambezi, no, it's a different word, but okay. how about Zambia and Zambian, right? Zambian, Zambian. No, it's not stemming as well. Zam but Zambians and Zambian is probably Zambian still, right? So I was thinking maybe Zambia and Zambian and Zambians would more or less be the same uh, root or something. But I don't, I don't know if you're getting the point here. The, the whole point of doing this is, again, you, you have to, I don't know if you appreciate the, uh, the fact that, um, the data set for ETDs, the examples that are in here, we'll be working with, let's as, as, just assume we are working with abstracts, that 500 or so words, right? Ultimately, the vector that you're going to derive is going to have to be composed of unique words found in all the documents in the corpus. So our corpus is about 3,000 documents, right? Or abstracts for 3,000 plus ETDs. So what you're doing is you're saying, get the abstract for document one, document two, document three, document three, the entire abstract of those sentences, all the way up to document 3000, and then get the unique set of words. Now, if you don't stem these things, if you don't remove stop words, you notice that that string, the vector itself, is going to be massive or huge, right? So that's the whole point of stemming and removing stop words or something. Uh, okay, I don't know if this is making sense, stemming, and uh, this is not that hard, is it? Stemming and all these different things here. <clears throat> Hopefully these import statements make sense. These others, you can ignore them. I, I normally, you notice that these, uh, we'll look at these once we look at uh, uh, term frequencies and uh, uh, term frequency in this document, uh, frequency, TFIDF. Um, so line number 10 and 11, we discuss them during data transformation. And then you almost always see line number 13 to 15 because it's just a, uh, it allows me to to uh, output cells in a certain way, right? Um, so for instance, when I run a cell that has multiple things, if I have this, it will be able to show output for the different uh, commands in that particular cell. Otherwise, if I don't have this, then I only see the output for the last command. Okay, uh, this is an example here. So um, I, th I thought maybe to, to just try and exemplify some of the things that we, we, we just went through here, maybe just a quick walkthrough for this data set, our data set here. Um, and as usual, what you want to do is you, you start by trying to, to understand the structure of the data itself. Um, we know this structure already, it's a pipe separated, um, um, well, it's a data set that has columns that are pipe separated here. Uh, so what I am doing as a very first thing is 
for me to be able to work with these within Python, I'm saying I am going to create a pandas data frame, right? So maybe I will I'll restart this from scratch so that we're able to walk through this together. I do hope people are able to work through this together with me. Uh, okay. okay, so import statements there. This is just uh, markdown, so it's not important. I'm just rendering this stuff here. Um, also not very important here. Um, so, like I said, what, what I'm doing here in, in this particular cell is just to, to inspect the contents of this CSV file. So I'm just running a shell command here, right? Um, a shell command that's just going to look at the last three records in this file. So these are the records here. Um, um, and then afterwards, what I am, and you could use tail if you want, I mean head if you want to, it doesn't matter, or cut. And then in this particular cell, what we're doing is we are creating a pandas data frame. Because the data we are working with is a CSV file, we have to use the function read under bar CSV. If this data was um, HTML or JSON, we'd have to use pd.readjson. So uh, the function that you use to read the data depends on the format of data that you're working with. And you'd know these things beforehand, but if someone just dish, dishes out data for you, one of the very first few things you will do is check the structure of the data, right, inspect it. So I create a pandas data frame. By default, it assumes that the commas, if you, if you run read CSV, it assumes that the records are separated by a comma, comma separated values, right? <coughs> but because the data that we are working with in this file are separated by the pipe symbol, I have to explicitly use the SEP, um, the SEP parameter here. I explicitly tell you to say this is, uh, it uses the pipe separator. Um, Again, it depends on the type of data that you're working with. Because we're working with abstracts, some, well, this is different. If you're working with abstracts, some abstracts in there will have full stops and commas because they're sentences, right? So you want to be very careful what you're using as a separator. Otherwise, you are confused, you're going to confuse pandas and then you have like a, a stuff that is not properly formatted in the data frame itself. Um, <clears throat> and then what I, and maybe I should have separated these here so that uh, people are able to see the, it doesn't matter. Line number two, I read the CSV file. Line number three just describes, or it shows me the different columns associated with the data itself. Hmm? What columns? So data frame name dot columns. What columns are associated with the data frame? I have a timestamp uh, column, full name, student ID, hometown, what is your program minus this is a long column, right? And, and really, uh, this explains why <clears throat> in line number six, and I almost, you almost always do this actually, especially if you're working with a data set that has a number of columns, right? You want to make sure that the columns you're working with use names that are much easier to work with. It would be difficult for you to have a column that is named, to start working with a column that is named, what made you decide on your computer program minor question mark? So what you do is you can take advantage of the rename function to rename these columns. This is what I'm doing here. So I'm providing a mapping to say for the column full name, rename it to student name. For column student ID, rename it to student ID one would combine together, right? These are nothing more than just a you know, uh, functions associated with uh, pandas that I'm using here. So I rename them in line number six. And then after I rename them, I again check to see if the renaming has worked to my satisfaction, right? So observe, the first, the first output here corresponds to the data frame dot column command, right? Which is line number three. The second output just, you won't have output for the second command because you're just renaming. And then finally, um, you have this output. These are the renamed columns. Right? So I rename my columns. And then it's a lot easier for me to work with these things. Um, and then finally, I 
I, again, within pandas, I say in line number 22, I just want to inspect that my, my formatted data frame, if we can use that word, the, the data frame that has now the revised column names, I want to see some sample records in that particular data frame. So I run data frame name, which is var ICT 1110 uh, tail. Again, similar to the shell command, I just want to take a peek at the last three records. Right? Now, because if you look at the number of records, because I have a number of records, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 records, for me to be able to make sense out of these records, sample records, I take advantage of yet another, I'm changing the commands here, I transpose it, right? So the dot T means just transpose the output. So observe, if in line number two, I don't transpose it, look at the output, right? It's transposed here, the, the columns are here, right? I don't know if you've gone through these examples. But if I don't transpose it, what I have is, is something that would ideally not really be, I guess it's not very visually appealing, for me anyway, so uh, usually it's, it's a lot easier for me to just twist it around so that I, I can see the records much better, but whatever works for you, right? Um, again, I, the, most of these things I think are things that probably came out when you, I hope you went through these exercises. I, I do encourage you to go through the exercises. Again, I'll share the solutions if, um, I'll share the solutions, you probably want to go through the solutions so that you understand some of these things because they'll come up over and over again. Especially merging, right? Merging of data sets, you see the renaming of the different columns, um, how you identify duplicates, how you describe um, a data frame, right? Data frame name don't describe, very simple things. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully this makes sense. So I've, I have renamed the columns and I'm satisfied that the resulting data frame, the modified data frame does make sense, it's fine, I can proceed to the next cell now. Um, again, so what I'm doing in this particular cell is I'm saying, um, and this I guess ties into our discussion here where I was saying sometimes it might be necessary for you to, to really try and explore the individual columns rather than looking at the records individually, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, um, I'm interested in getting a sense of the different miners. Uh, and I was just curious here because I was, I was interested in knowing uh, the motivation behind students choosing miners. It's, it's strange, it's strange the decision they, they use that side, right? When you ask them, they say, it's because the second year said this is easy. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, that's an interesting way of looking at this. If I were here, looking at different things. So, um, line number two, uh, what I'm saying is I am, again, using tell function here. I, I want to just isolate this one column. So I want to see the contents of the column minor program. And I just want to see the last 15 records, which is why I'm chaining this dot tell. And, tell command. and already you can see here I have, uh, for the records that I have, the last the last, uh, the last couple of 15 records here, record number 24, they're up to 38, have history, history, mathematics, academic writing and studying mathematics. Um, and because this was coming from a questionnaire, by the way, which is why some characters would be shouting and writing uppercase maths, right? Some would be doing the right thing. Some would use all lowercase. Students. <coughs> okay. So again, uh, after I, I look at the last couple of records, what I'm doing here is uh, just counting, right? Um, I'm interested in just counting uh, the different miners that are there, and I'm converting it to a list, really. Uh, just trying to showcase the fact that uh, you can, within pandas, using a pandas data frame, you can convert the data into um, a different data structure if you want to, depending on the type of, uh, operations that you're performing. Okay, so converting it into a list here. Um, uh, and then, I don't know if people, I don't know if you're following here, but uh, would we be able to speculate why we have line number eight here? What the hell is going on here? How are we able to, so if you look at 
in line number five, I'm just we're just counting the total number of entries of minors, right? But in line number seven, there's a comment that says extract the unique program minor entries. Can we guess how we are? Should I zoom this in? Can we guess how line number eight results in a unique set of minors? Go back here. Line number eight here. How is it possible that we're able to get the unique entries here using this? If you want to look at the output, by the way, it's here. These are all the miners. Uh, well, these are the unique miners, actually. I'm getting the final unique miner. This is a count, and then these are the unique miners. Forget the fact that um, uh, this is supposed to be, it's unique, but because of casing, right? It's a bit of an issue here, but I was hoping people could uh, remember what's happening here, the use of set and list. If you remember the traits of uh, those different data structures, a set, a list, tuple, uh, you remember that um, a set, a set will always, and this is where these, these cheap tricks come in handy, right? A set will always, x is equal to, One, one, five, four. Do you remember this? So a set will always, you know, if you, irrespective of whether you have duplicate entries, but it will just return unique entries. Right? So um, <clears throat> just, I guess, a reminder to us to say, in certain instances, you'd have to use some of these Python idioms and uh, to achieve your overall objective, right? And implicitly, by the way, some of the things we are doing here tied to another phase that we'll soon ex explore, uh, exploratory data analysis, right? So we're analyzing the data, trying to make sense out of um, uh, the contents of the data. Already I have a sense of, for this particular, uh, this particular column, I know that the entries I have are not using a consistent casing. Uh, I don't know if people can spot some other things here, uh, first years. Typos, they're probably typos here, I guess, I don't know. I don't, I hope there are typos, please. <clears throat> okay, pause for the typos. Outlier, right, this was me, it was a test. There's no minor course called data mining. So already this would be like a classic outlier. What do you do with an outlier? The wise thing to do for this is you just check it out because this is wrong, right? <clears throat> um, you know, already if I was analyzing this, this would be like a, a stop word, right? And now it would depend on whether it would be necessary for me to remove stop words here. Perhaps not actually, because, I mean, it depends. Do you think it would be necessary for us to remove stop words or not? For this particular data set, perhaps not, right? Because the meaning of this, these are actually program miners, so you want to maintain the meaning, right? Um, yeah, so. I was hoping I could find a, a typo, but there's no. <clears throat> Here's the other thing, right? And I, I don't know. I don't know what would classify this as, right? So, this is language. This is languages 1220 and 1200. But it's a minor. This person probably misrepresented the question, right? And decided to, to write the actual course codes, right? Instead of just a program minor. But these are things to think about. This is what I'm trying to get at here is that. This data set already tells us that we need to clean it up somehow, right? Reconcile things that we know are common somehow. Now, how you go about reconciling these is probably up to you. In my case, maybe uh, by just inspecting this data, I would say remove all numbers already, right? I would probably use, uh, could use a regular expression package and just say isolate all the numbers because I don't want the cost codes. I just want the, 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 the minor name, right? Um, in certain instances, maybe come up with a mapping or something that makes sense uh, to say, whenever you see, look at this. This is the same as this character is providing the, the course code instead of the actual minor, right? So these are things to think about here. Case folding, um, outliers, uh, white space, thank you, punctuation, right? This, the casing is the same. The question to ask yourself is why, why is it that we have unique entries but uh, these are considered 
these two things are considered uh, to be separate entities. This has a white space. I don't know what this character was thinking. Maybe it was a mistake and they pressed the space bar or something. Right, so, <clears throat> right. so the question then is, I mean, how, how exactly do we go about doing these different things, right? I was just pointing out the obvious things here, but how do we go about case folding and whatnot? Turns out it's trivial stuff for the most part. Um, in fact, case folding is probably one of the easiest things, right? Um, string objects allow you access to certain cool functions like lower, title, thank you very much, or upper, upper, right? So in this case, all I'm doing is um, first I count, before I apply case folding, I'm trying, line number three, I'm trying to say I want to count all the entries for the minors. After I count them, in line number six, I was well, just a, a short form. I'm looping through because this is a list, right? I am looping through. I am looping through this list, and every time I loop, this is a short form anyway. Every time I loop, uh, I apply for each entry that I loop through. I get the lowercase version of that entry, right? Um, uh, and then I put everything into a list. Uh, once I put everything into a list, I go to, and I, I think I should have been counting here. Let me just run this. Uh, so when I count the entries at 25, I look through the list and then uh, make sure that I'm using a consistent lowercase casing for everything else. What I should do here is confirm to say once I, I, I apply case folding to all the entries, do I end up with less than with less than 25 entries? I should because there are some characters that had uh, all uppercase things, right? Oh, it's the same. Why? I guess it's because of maths again. I was hoping mathematics would actually. You see, this is a bad example. I was hoping things like maths would uh, come up, but this maths again has. Uh, a punctuation. So this will probably give us a correct thing once we apply, uh, we remove the punctuations. And this, this brings us to another interesting question. I don't know if you're thinking about this, right? Uh, what, when you're working with text, because you're doing so many different things, the question to ask yourself is what do you start with first? You see, uh, you're, you're case folding, you're stemming, you're removing the stop words. So you're, you're removing the stop words. I don't know if people are thinking about these stop words. Stem, stemming, punctuation. Uh, what else? Case folding. Uh, what else are we, for text processing, this is pretty much it. Right? So the question to ask yourself, right, is what, what, what is, does the order matter? Does it matter that you first of all start by STEMI, stop words, punctuation, case folding, or you, stop, you start with stop words, and then you STEM, you remove punctuations, and cause case folding. I don't know if people are thinking about it, sorry? Okay, what, what order would you follow? <laughs> Why do you think it matters though? Do you have an example in mind or something? This is interesting. I think uh, if you're going to remove the right? Right. You have to remove the same case first. Right, yeah. The that is true. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So remove the punct. That's a key thing here. If you think about remove the punctuation, if you think uh, 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 something like um, Zambian, full stop, because the full stop is closer to the end. If you don't remove, uh, so I am Zambian, and then. A, a Zambian, a Zambian, a Zambian is an interesting character or something. You notice that this occurrence of Zambian is different from this because this full stop is immediate after the end. So then it makes sense that we have probably removed punctuations first. Um, I don't know what other order you'd follow here. Uh, you, did you suggest punctuations and then you said what else? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> right. So punctuation. I mean, so you, you put, the last thing you'd want to do is stem before you remove the stop words, right? So 
you, you, we know that you definitely need to remove the stop weights before you stand, right? So uh, this is getting interesting. In fact, if I, if I, if I, what I would do is after I remove the punctuations, then I would personally apply case folding, right? Just because if you look at uh, if you run stop weights dot weights in courts English, those are all our case, right? So I would apply case folding, and then after case folding, then I would apply, I would remove the stop weights. After I remove the stop weights, then I, I stem, right? And then after stemming, then I would start thinking about uh, deduplication. Um, although when you're looking at uh, a text, text content, like the abstracts, there would be no need for deduplication because it's, it's a chunk of text, right? 500, 500 anywhere between 200 and 500, Maybe it's a thousand, I don't know DRGS guide, guidelines here. Uh, what to expect? This would be fun before we wrap up. We still have time, actually. Uh, DRGS. It's, I don't know if people are following with what, um, what we are. Hmm. I want to show us something here. Uh, academic. Hmm. There we go. <clears throat> so if you look at the DRGS uh, regulations, it says uh, the abstract is uh, 500 words. So what you expect is, you expect, if you're working with the ETDs, you expect to be working with, the example we have, we have 3,000 plus ETDs. You cannot apply, uh, you can't, you wouldn't, the last thing you want to do is duplicate the actual abstracts uh, because what you're working with is, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there a way of, of identifying duplicates in, I don't know if I'm making sense here. You have 500 words, text, for an abstract, another chunk of text. How would you run the duplicate function, right? Perhaps you'd remove the, the duplicates using the unique key identifier, that's what I'm saying. Or maybe, this is interesting, I've never really thought about this. If you have, uh, you, 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 you read the abstract, the 3,000 abstracts, 500 words each. 500 words, five, approximately 500 words, approximately 500 words, all the way up to 3,000 occurrences, right? One, two, three, up to 3,000 plus occurrences. Would we be able to get the text, the 500 words, electronic engineering, blah, 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 that's abstract, right, 500 words. Can we deduplicate based on the chunks of words, that's what, what I'm saying? I think it's possible. Yeah, okay, if it's possible then deduplication, perhaps before stemming or after stemming. In fact, it wouldn't matter if you did deduplication after or before stemming, why? Because if these are duplicates, whether you stem or you don't stem, it's the same thing, right? Um, but these are things to think about anyway, as you are running these, some of these things, you want to make sure that you think, up, think things through. And in fact, when you are running these, when you're doing this in actual practice, you try out different variations of things. What works, you, uh, you carry forward. If it doesn't work, then you, know, you try out something else that could potentially work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, I, I'm waffling around here, like going to DRGS regulations to try and show you that I'm able to work on this particular problem because I understand the domain. I know where to look for information if I'm trying to verify things. But if I was like Francis, what I would have to do, and I'm working with uh, some really smart students who are doing this, I would have had to go to DRGS, sit down with people, business understanding, right? How is an abstract formatted and whatnot? <clears throat> anyway, and then they'll be able to explain to you why you find, uh, ooh, why you find, uh, what was I running? Was this one uh, here? Okay, see it. Uh, why you find things like, uh, okay, there's no abstract here. Why you find, I must, I must uh, just show you this exa example just so we can, they'll be able to tell you, uh, and if you didn't understand, if you did not understand this, you would go there and ask them, say, but why is it that when I look at the records, 
the the abstract why do you start the abstract with with the word abstract dot right you know like if you notice that this is because this is the way it is by the way we just lifted the stuff there then maybe they'll tell you oh, no no this is a mistake so then you know that when you're cleaning up the data your abstract should get rid of this because if you include this thing it's going to distort your results right especially if there are other abstracts that don't have this abstract word I don't know if I'm making sense here but that's all part of the cleaning up process anyway um, <clears throat> all right uh, so we, we do case folding and unfortunately this was a bad example because we after applying case folding it turns out that we have the same number of records why because of punctuations um, <clears throat> Okay, and, and uh, if you're ashamed here, that, but it's fine. Uh, I'm not using pandas to deduplicate here. So for deduplication, because this is a relatively simple data set, I'm taking advantage of my knowledge of the different Python data structures. I know that a set contains unique words. So I'm attempting to deduplicate here, and I know this, this won't work. Well, did it work? I wonder why. Did, I, did we remove punctuations here? Why is this working, but it didn't work before? Interesting. I don't know if people have noticed what's happening here. You see, when we ran this here, right? When we check the length of, um, we, we're checking the length of the of the this data from that has the minus. It's twenty five, right? It's twenty five, and then we we apply case folding. We convert everything to lower case and then count it again after converting everything to lowercase, right? And then it turns out that we still have 25. But then when we come here and we... This is interesting. <clears throat> yes? Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't duplicate, we didn't du duplicate here, yeah. So, we do, we do in fact have things that are the same, like there's no difference between religious studies and religious studies. So we're actually deduplicating in this cell below, right? So this is good, there are actually three religious studies here. So you notice that we, um, we deduplicate here. And really you notice that what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm using lists and sets here, a combination of lists and sets, because I'm working with lists I, uh, I convert, uh, I, this, is a, this is a list, right? I convert it to a set so that I get unique values and then convert it back to a list. Just because I prefer myself to work with lists. Uh, lists are, are very intuitive because they're like arrays, right? So I'm very used to that type of data structure. Um, but you could just as well have converted this to a tuple now that you've deduplicated, right? Doesn't matter. And in fact, a tuple is more efficient than a list, if you remember our discussion. Um, right, so finally we end up with a list of 20 unique entries for our sm small corpus here. Uh, and then an example of um, punctuation, and, and I don't know if people are again following, if you, if you compare what we are walking through to what we said here, we it turns out that the different variations of doing things, we did not start with removing punctuations first. I don't know if you noticed that. We, we did case folding and then deduplication, uh, and, and then now we're doing punctuation removal. Whether this results in something that makes sense or not is besides the point, we're just showcasing the process you'd go through, right? Um, right, so removing the punctuations here, Again, I'm, I'm going through the process. I always do this. You'll find this in most of the cells that are, the, the Jupyter Notebooks I'll be sharing. I always test things before and after to see what the difference is like. So um, more or less in most of the cells, I have the same things before and after so that I see if there's any change, <clears throat> right? So um, uh, what I'm doing in line number six here is, uh, again, I'm looping through the list, right? This is list comprehension is what they call it here. Instead of for, for I in that do the loop, it's just a shortcut here. It's a shortcut for what you do with the for loop here. 
miscomprehension. Uh, so what I'm doing is uh, the removal of uh, punctuations here is very basic. I am trimming. Uh, when you, well, stripping, sorry. When you're stripping, I think you're removing text. Is it before or after or just after something? I don't know. We can test this. Observe, if you have uh, x is equal to Zambian with, a, with two spaces. Enter. x with two spaces, right? If I say this dot strip, notice that you are removing. But what, what if we, I think, I don't know if strip is before and after or after alone. X, X has a padding before and after, a white space rather. So if I run X with strip, so it, it's after and before, which is why I'm running this, this strip uh, function there. Right, so that I remove any white space, thank you for the white space, before and after. Uh, and then after I remove the white space before and after, again, to dedupli deduplicate, I again take advantage of the fact that a set um, only returns unique values and then I convert it back to a list. Again, sorry if this is confusing, but the reason I do this is because lists are much easier to work with. Right? You can do so much with lists. Okay, so if I run this and compare the, the result of punct and whatnot, you notice that, um, and in fact what we should do here is uh, we have 20 and 15. Notice that? Is it 20 and 15? Yeah. So we have 20 and 15. So after we remove the white space, we reduce the size of our corpus to 15 from 20. Initially it was 25, 15, 25, 20, 15. Oh, hi. Oh, we are coming just now, coming up. <coughs> just slide. Um, and then, I mean, uh, stop with removal here. I'm just, uh, so I'm, I'm saying I just want, I don't want to see all the 179, if you remember the two numbers of English stop words, I just want to see the first 20, just to make sure that I'm working with English stop words. Um, and then once I do that, uh, in here, I'm removing the stop words. Again, uh, I was going to say I'm losing this comprehension here. Yes, it is this comprehension, but rather complex thing here. Uh, I'm looping through the, uh, resulting 15 words, right? <clears throat> and then I am saying for each of the words in, in this new corpus that has 15 entries, after removing the, the punctuations, these things here, for each one of these, I am, I am going to attempt to remove things like and, 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 and in fact, and is probably the only stop word here. I don't know if this is. So uh, in this cell, what I'm doing is I'm saying, remove all the different stop words and then stitch the words together. In fact, I'm doing a number of things here. What am I doing? Be because the, you, you have to th think for, for a second and pause. You, couldn't, you can't possibly remove stop words as a whole because some minors are a combination of dif different words. So what you're doing is you want to say for each one of these entries, Look through the different words and detect if one of the words is a stop word. If it is, remove it, right? So this doesn't apply, but when, the moment you come to languages, you are going to look through, check, is languages into the stop word list? If it is, remove it. If not, leave it, right? Is this in the stop word list? And then you come to and you find that it is. But again, I'm taking advantage of list comprehension here. Uh, so not here, the next cell. Uh, and then finally, you notice that my resulting corpus will not have and, right? The ands are not there. Uh, listen, the, the stemming part is pretty trivial as well. All we're doing here is, um, and, and you, again, you see this over and over again when you're working with data frames. So for, if, if, you, if one of the columns has text in a data frame, what you do is you look through the entries in that data frame, and then you apply um, a particular function, right? So if you are stemming, then you say for this column, just apply Potter stem or something. So you run the uh, data frame value dot stem, right? Oh, sorry, is it this stemmer instance dot stem and then the data frame uh, column that you're looping through, column value that you're looping through at that point in time. Um, that's it. So it's what I'm trying to say is in most of these instances, when you're removing stop words from a data frame or when you are stemming contents in the data frame, you are looping through all the records and applying this. 
Um, yeah, so you're creating an instance of the stem and then just testing that uh, it actually works on languages. Uh, and then uh, I'm checking the length here. And I'm checking the length because I want to see once I stem, is it going to result in, and this is a terrible example because uh, um, uh, I, I don't know if there's actually a change. I mean, what are we stemming here, right? You understand what I mean? We will stem studies, it will be star D, but it won't make a difference. We'll probably still end up with the same, um, same, same size of the corpus. Uh, so I, I apply Potter's stemmer there, and then quite right, it, we see that it works once you stem these things. Mathamat, French, data mining, you know, religious education, history, um, all these different things. And then let's see what happens when we count. Uh, oh, it looks like it worked. I don't know where the one stemmed value is. <laughs> this is strange. I, I don't know if people can, the parting away thing here, I don't know if people can notice what has been stemmed. Oh, what is this? So this out of these things here, what are we stem, what are we stemmed to its root? Sorry, geography. Where is, where is the other geography? Language and languages. Oh, thank you, right. <laughs> yeah, there we go, okay. So we know where the one is, languages and language, right. Thanks. Um, I don't know what game this was. I don't know if this is special paper two or something, it'll probably fail. But um, I, I do hope, uh, I don't know, this is, I hope this is a, Okay, introduction to to the text preprocessing part. Perhaps uh, image preprocessing. You want us to include it? We can include it here. But this other exercise that is here, um, I guess. Well, maybe we can work through this exercise and see if we can uh, we can we can clean up the data associated with, because in the survey, it's, there's a fun part of the survey where we ask people what, what, uh, what's, what is interesting about you? And I find it interesting the things that people state as interesting things about them, right? Um, this was me saying I cycle, but uh, some people say I sing and whatnot, so I thought it would be nice if we could try and see if we can clean up that column as an exercise, uh, and then Hopefully we're meeting on Tuesday or something. We should come with masks, but uh, <laughs> but I'll confirm with uh, Dr. Pierre and, and, and Dr. Nirinda just to find out that we're doing the correct things. At the very least, depending on what you decide as a group, what I would suggest is maybe we can start small. Maybe a first initial session will be, if we're going to go the Hangouts route, first initial se session will be we can look at this example and another example where we get to look at ETDs and work, work through them and try and see if we can all be on the same page. I think that this uh, closure thing is a blessing in disguise because then if we, because if we combine this with, um, <laughs> with the Hangouts, maybe we can cover much more once we come back, I think. We should be good, actually. In fact, maybe we can invite more people to come if the people that we invited won't uh, change their minds because I know Enes was really looking forward. He was... Uh, I, I, I bumped into him the other time and he was telling me, he was giving me an example of what they do with brain scans. I was shocked when they are, they are reading, because part of his job is they, they send them through the CT scans, MRI scans, and then they have to interpret what is wrong with the patient, right? And he was, I don't know if that was an MRI scan or CT scan. It, it can have, if it's a brain scan, it can have as many as a thousand images apparently that they have to manually sieve through. I remember joking and asking him, do you mean to tell me you manually go through the thousand documents? And he tells me, no. You actually have to prioritize because with, with time you get to know which parts of the images you look at, right? And I sat there and I'm thinking, we have people, smart people in this group and elsewhere, right? Maybe fourth years that can potentially work on these problems, right? The, the funny part, and he told me he included this in his talk, right? The funny part is the things he was going to talk about is no, the difficulties in transmitting data, and I'm telling him, 
we are way past that. I don't think people are interested in that, right? But they struggle with very basic things. Just to give you an idea of what's going on at UTH. They, the office where you, you know, when you go for a scan, there's an office. There is no connection between the computers that people use to read the scans and the offices that are right next to them. So what they do is they get the CD, you give it to someone like the registrar, get the CD, put it there, read it, and it's, it's, it's a horrible, right? Um, I sat there and I'm thinking, but this is, this is probably stuff that our second years or first years can actually do. But hopefully, it is my hope that, uh, I know Ines and I have been chatting about what we could potentially do together as a group, but hopefully maybe some people in here might be interested in working in that area. Maybe we can chat to Ines and see what we can do. Okay, thank you. I hope this was helpful somehow. Uh, gentle steps, eventually we start looking at uh, maybe the maths, the stuff that people are interested in the most. Thank you. See you. Oh, hi. There's a question on the code. Yes. On the part for um, stop weights. Yes. Below? Why you use join? Yes. Oh, so because um, because what I'm doing is if you if you notice I I'm I'm using and this was uh, I normally do these things to showcase to people to say the real power of Python is in part in things called miscomprehensions. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm looping through all these different. Um, I'm, I'm looping through the. Sorry, I'm looping through these entries, right? The ones that are up here, here, these things. When I look through them, because the only way to check through stopways is not as a string as a whole, but you need to individual, individual. Right. So you, so you can't, them and then you no, split them. No, so first I split them. You see this? I, I, I first of all I so, say. So this two in here. So I look through this, uh -huh. um, and then let's see here. There's a lot of stuff happening here, and I think this would make more sense actually if this, if you did this, if you actually split it up like, because there are a number of list comprehensions that I'm using here. I know this is one other list comprehension here. <clears throat> so I, I loop, you notice I loop through all the different uh, miners that we have, mm -hmm. and then I split them. Yes. Right, but mm -hmm. when I split them, I'm saying uh, w when I when I split them here, what I'm saying is uh, actually, oh, so I I split them here, and then I'm saying because this is another list comprehension here, mm -hmm. the result that is coming f from here is going to feed into this list comprehension. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying once I split them, for each of the individual things that I'm splitting, only return the things that are not stop words. Mm -hmm. When I return them, so when I come here, right, I'll give you an example of this. Mm -hmm. I split this up, mm -hmm. and then I say as part of that list comprehension, only return the things that are not in stop words. Because this is a stop word, mm -hmm. I will not return it. But it's returned as a list. Mm -hmm. after, it's, after this is returned as a list, I have to join it. Oh. This is why I'm joining it. And I'll, I'm reconstructing the sentence without the stop words. Okay. Right? Um, and then I, just, I have to join it with a space. Yeah, so oh. that's, it's, uh, okay. it's retarded, I know, but I'm sure there's a problem. I, I normally include this to... Oh, so first you split. Yeah. Then before returning, everything it turns, brings, it has to be separated by a space. So it takes it back to the way it was. Yes. But minus. Is yeah, so it's like you're, reconstru you're reconstructing what was there without the stop words. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was trying the exercise for the market. Did? Okay. And I realized, because you can't import PDF in Panda, right? You can't import PDF files. No, I don't think you can read PDF so, files. So we had to like manually copy the, like just copy the. Text. Wait a minute, can't you, can't you read the PDF? It says you can do okay. Yeah. So I realized I tried to manually import. The yeah, but the, the th cool thing is uh, there's probably a PDF to, to text package, so you can do that. Oh, PDF okay. to text, and so then. You can it to text. Yeah, and then you import the text. Oh, and then, oh, okay. Because we've got PDF to text, and I'm sure there's some other fancy packages. What it does is it tries to recreate the structure of the thing, so you'll be able to see some table there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, uh, I don't know. Okay. 
Yeah, sure. See you. Uh, uh, let me know if you need more exercises. We have more exercises, and then I can share these things. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Stay safe. You never know this corona thing or something, right?